welcome back to the Dowie podcast. My guest today is Lindsay Wei. Uh, Lindsay is a 24th generation practitioner of the Chun Yang sect of Wudong Taoism and a 31st generation Longmen Dragon Gate Taoism. She spent nine years studying in China under her master Li Song Feng and is one of his senior instructors at the Five Immortals Temple in the Wudong Mountains. Lindsay's own organization is Wudong White Horse, through which she teaches internal martial arts, health practices, and ancestral skills online and at in-person camps. She's the author of two books, Path of the Spiritual Warrior, Life and Teachings of Muay Thai Fighter Pedro Solana, and also The Valley Spirit, A Female Story of Taoist Cultivation. Lindsay, thanks for talking to me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I look forward to speaking with you. So speaking of your book, The Valley Spirit, uh, one of the first questions I usually ask people is how they got into martial arts. And uh, there have only been two different answers so far of everybody I've asked this of. One is that they were getting beat up at school, which was my answer. And the other one is that they were into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So uh, I, I feel like your answer is pretty different. Um, what, what led you to get involved in martial arts and Taoism? Yeah, for me, it was a love of movement arts <clears throat> and a wish to reconnect to my heritage and my Chinese ancestry. So in, in high school years, I did dance and became very passionate about that. And it was the art that I felt I could most naturally express myself through. Uh, and then moving forward, I didn't know if I wanted to become a professional dancer, mostly because it was <clears throat> seemingly very urban based. Mm. And uh, so in searching for what I wanted to do with my life, I ended up taking a trip to China to study Wushu uh, in Beijing at um, the Beijing Capital Sports University. And uh, I just fell in love with that movement art and realized that it suited me better than dance uh, based on its practical uses and its kind of evolution with a spiritual practice, whether that was Buddhism and Shaolin, for example, or in Wudang, that was Taoism. And I, I never went back to dance and have just been doing martial arts ever since. So that was, that was really the reason that, that I got into Chinese martial arts. Okay. Then when I, when I came back to the States, I, I cross trained in, in other styles and, uh, had to explore more of the self-defense arts and sparring and the combat, uh, side of things more when I came back to the States. Now that trip, that initial trip that you went to, to train in China, that wasn't your first trip to China. Is that correct? That. No, I went on a brief trip uh, when I was 15, and that was my first time. And then when I when I went back at age 18, that that was my second trip. But in a way, I think of that as my as my mm. first real trip because I stayed for a long time uh, and became really immersed in, in the language and the culture and traveled more and yeah. So you, in your book, The Valley Spirit, you described your teenage self as being a typical American teenager, kind of rebellious and disrespectful, but um, a typical American teenager doesn't usually graduate high school and then move to China to study martial arts. That's, it's a combination of um, like a sense of adventure and a lot of, uh, takes a lot of determination, a lot of rigorous physical and mental. What, what was the desire there? What combined those two things for you? Yeah, I, I did have a lot of determination to seek a lifestyle that hadn't been proposed to me yet. There was a lifestyle proposition that is given to, you know, I think every teenager of following the path of going to college, um, securing a career for yourself, and kind of going along with that current of, of life. Uh, trajectory. And I was very determined to find something different. And that was really the impetus there. Uh, and yeah, and, and I think also it was a combination of feeling a little lost too, and then just following my, uh, <clears throat> I guess, intuition, you could say, uh, just following 
my heart. And uh, that's what led me to eventually finding Leisure Fu and having that experience, which then shaped the rest of my life. So prior to to going to Wudong and studying with Li Shifu, you uh, you actually trained at one of the schools in the Dongfeng region around the Shaolin Temple. Was that right? I did. Yeah. And uh, was it just that you were missing a spiritual aspect there? Is that what caused you to go further down the road and see what else was there? I think so. I think there there was still just an aspect of searching. I knew somewhere inside that I hadn't fully found what I was looking for yet, even though I loved Shaolin and I loved the the people there and the culture there and the style. Uh, once I arrived at Wudong, everything clicked though. And I realized this is actually the style that, that I want to pursue long-term. Shaolin, uh, maybe I didn't have the same affinity with uh, Buddhism there, or maybe the school that I was at didn't fully integrate the the buddhist teachings into the shaolin kung fu but uh it was a very hard style of training there it was a, a hard lifestyle um very physical however then in in wudang in the school that i landed in because of its proximity to Zhaogong, the purple heaven palace uh which is a taoist temple and its location high in the mountains, the the culture of Taoism, the presence of Taoism was much more tangible and felt inside of all of the the daily practice, the forms, uh, the lifestyle. Do you feel like your Shaolin training gave you a good physical foundation for your Wudong training? Is that something you definitely. think helped you? Oh, definitely. Everything leading up to that point gave me uh, a foundation in Kung Fu, the Wushu training, the Shaolin training, all of it. And it's interesting because many people follow that same yeah. path. Actually, some of the instructors at the Wudang school had originally passed through Shaolin. Uh, Li Shifu himself grew up in Henan province uh, and... They say that Zhen Wu also passed through mm -hmm. Shaolin before Wudang. So there must be something about that, that pathway. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, for sure. So when we're talking about Wudong, uh, you know, that, that name uh, kind of elicits uh, strong reactions in some people, you know, what, what, when you say Wudong to some people, they're like, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's the highest of the high. And then some other people um, have a sort of like a, I don't want to say a negative reaction, but but they but they tend to think that you know Wudong is something that's you know um, you know maybe reconstituted or, or maybe you know there's some, there's some debate about that. But as as someone who actually lived in Wudong and practiced Wudong arts for a long time, what would you say to both of those sides? What, what's the reality of Wudong arts that they might not know about? Well, I think first of all, one could have that criticism of any of the styles that they sure. were you know reconstituted mm -hmm. after the cultural revolution right. or, or i'm not sure exactly what that criticism is but i think you could say that about any of the styles uh, all of them have breaks in the line uh, and reinventing them in our modern era but and i don't think that wudang is you know the best or better either i think it does have this prowess of being an advanced form of kung fu mm -hmm. wherein it's i think that's part of the taoist piece where you've gone through this full evolution in your training and self-cultivation where your main goal is no longer self-defense right. or harming others uh, but rather cultivating your inner nature and um, a lot of the techniques are not necessarily directly deadly but rather disarming um, mm -hmm. and nonviolent. and so i guess you know in some ways with especially wudong swordsmanship being almost like uh 
like the chess of swordsmanship, I guess, yeah. where wherein it's this um, strategic, calculative, high level execution of movements um, to to actually circle around and bring peace and harmony. Yeah, I agree. I think Wudong arts are something that you actually have to practice before you understand what they're about, because they're things that you can actually do for the rest of your life. And they continually build you in various ways. And uh, But it's something that you have to do to see for yourself. You can't just, you know, judge it from the outside. Right. I guess that's the part where there would be doubt or criticism, because with internal styles, there's some mysticism involved. Things are not always easy to see with an untrained eye. <clears throat> and so people could then, you know, falsely represent it or or there could be just doubt of of it being you know, real or not. Um, and I think you'll get that with anything that has a spiritual nature to it or an unseen hidden nature, uh, formless aspects to it. There's always going to be that doubt or those who who don't see it right so when you met your teacher Li Shifu uh how long did it take you to know that that he was the teacher that you were you were going to stick with mm. I don't know if I really knew instantly uh because as I think as I described in my book or I've told people before he kind of ignored me the very first trip um, and, uh, there was a lot going on in my life at the time and it took, it took several months. Uh, I, it just so happened that I was going back to the States right after my first encounter with him. So I had time to process that. And I, I think I was like on the verge of maybe giving up my whole mm -hmm. pursuit in China, but decided to go back one last time and spend time with this teacher. And then I think it was on that second trip where I went to go visit him that it became uh, obviously uh, obvious immediately that this was someone who I wanted to enter into a long term mentorship under. And uh, he became like a father figure to me. You know, it was probably a mutual feeling, too, because I found that a lot of times with traditional teachers like that, what they really want is someone who really wants to learn, learn for real, you know, dedicate themselves to it. And so, you know, sometimes people come and people go. But when they come back, uh, I think I feel like a teacher, you know, appreciates that and sees that. Um, so can you describe what your your initial training was him with him was like when you went back that that second time to train with him? What sorts of things did you train in? <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was, um, um, so I was living day in and day out at the temple. Uh, there were only a handful of people there. Li Shifu himself, one of his Chinese disciples, a nun, an older nun who was cooking, um, a young boy whose parents wanted him to study under Li Shifu and sent him there. And that was the group of us. And uh, so everything was happening in the Chinese language. No one spoke English. <clears throat> we were in a remote setting. Uh, it was just a matter of I would I would wake up and I was already in the habit of training full time. So I was pretty uh, I had good self-discipline. I would wake up. I would train in the front courtyard uh <clears throat> the forms that i already knew in a way i was still trying to prove myself and display that i had discipline and focus and was essentially waiting for him to give me some teachings and i would ask him questions i would show him my forms and slowly i don't remember how long it took he you know decided i'm going to teach you some of the Chuyang uh, traditional forms. And he started teaching me Bagua. I think actually the, the Babu Chuyang may have been the first thing that I learned from him. And uh, it was very much like he would show me the movement once or twice, and then he would leave. Mm. And if I didn't remember it, then I had to go back and ask him. And sometimes he wouldn't have time or mm. would be unwilling. Mm. And 
it really looked a lot like that. There was no hand holding. There was no um, like coaching me through it and training alongside of me. It was it was literally he would show me once or twice. And if I missed it, then I missed it. And uh, so then I it was up to me to practice what he taught me, formulate questions, show that I had processed the movements. Uh, same thing with meditation. <clears throat> he would give me some instructions and I would sometimes be allowed to take notes, but other times not allowed to take notes because of the tradition of oral transmission. Mm -hmm. And so then sometimes I would like run back to my room and like write down everything that I could remember. And then I would practice it and I would report back with experiences that I had had and questions that I had. And this was how I learned. And it's a very traditional way to learn that you can, I mean, even now when <clears throat> Westerners go there to learn, it's not so much able to follow this way anymore because it's larger groups and there's translators. And um, <clears throat> in a way there's more teachings accessible that way. Um, it's not such a slow process, uh, a hard earned process, but in this way, I, I think, it was very special to progress in this way. Um, the reason why traditionally Taoists would teach in that way is that ensures that you, the teacher is never saying too much too soon. Mm -hmm. It's always prompted by the question, which means you're ready to receive the answer. <clears throat> and there's, yeah, there's a saying called bu wen bu shuo. So if the student doesn't ask, then you don't say. You never give too much information, which is almost the exact opposite in our Western mentality, where we're just like trying to share everything in order to, um, you know, give the students some interest or something like that. Right. It's, it's backwards. Right. Yeah, I feel training or teaching in that method also, uh, you know, it trains the uh, student to pay attention. Because, you know, ultimately, whatever it is they're going to be doing is going to be their own. They have to sort of like find, like you said, find those questions for themselves. It has to come out of them. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you can show the people the movements, but it's it's not quite the same. It doesn't quite have the same strength, I think. But it's it's Definitely. difficult. <clears throat> Everything then that you discover, yes, becomes your own. Um, and you and you never have knowledge that is not based in your own experience. Right. So were you from the get-go training with him, were the, uh, was, was the teaching of Taoism and the teaching of, of your martial arts uh, one and the same? Was it an inseparable process or, or, or did the Taoist uh, philosophy training come later after the martial arts? <clears throat> it was one and the same. And I think part of that is the context of living inside of the temple. So uh, when you live inside of the temple, you, you know, you wake up, you sweep the temple floors, you clean the altar, you light incense, you start <clears throat> learning the morning and evening scriptures. And uh, so you're tending to the altars and the deities daily. And so you can't really separate that when, when that's your, your lifestyle. Uh, and you know, even aside from that, Li Shifu's teaching style is completely intertwined. The Taoist teachings and the martial teachings, for sure. All of it is very holistic and interrelated. Uh, to compartmentalize the different aspects of the training, like separating like Qigong out from the martial, out from the meditation, out from the scriptures, was not, um, was not the way. The way there was everything was interrelated and I wouldn't separate them. It's it's only <clears throat> kind of in the Western context and when trying to explain it to people uh, that you you kind of uh, inevitably have to divide things apart to explain them. But in 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 that traditional way, they they were all interrelated and all one in the same. So you talk about all of this and, and a lot more in your, your book, The Valley Spirit. Um, uh, were you how when did you realize that you were going to write a book about your experiences? Was that something that you kind of knew in the back of your head from the beginning as soon as you started to go to China or did that come much later? 
Um, that came later. That actually wasn't my idea. It, um, my original publisher asked me to write the book and kind of planted the seed of the concept of the book as well. It being like a female perspective on the Taoist and Marshall path. So that that's really what the uh, the impetus behind writing the book was was being asked and then uh, answering that call knowing that there was a need <clears throat> a need for that storyline to come out yeah for sure i i think that the book works on a lot of levels you know it's a it's an adventure story and kind of a travelogue and a martial arts memoir and it's a spiritual journey but you know as as the sub as the uh you know the title it's a female story of dallas cultivation and it's a i don't know of another book the, the only other martial memoir that I know of that um, is sort of in the same vein is Andrea Falk's book, uh, Bitter, Beijing Bittersweet. But in her her time in China was at the end of the Cultural Revolution. And she was essentially being minded all of the time. You know, she had a very uh, contained experience, whereas is your experience was much different, much freer environment. And it's a it's a very honest book, um, you know, which I think was what makes it so powerful. You don't really pull any punches anywhere in, in the book. I think it's great for everyone to read. Um, there was a story in the book that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, you you were gathering some herbs, some mugwort to make moxa with, and uh, you uh, could you tell that story? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I guess that that one stands out to a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So we were gathering mugwort uh, on the fifth of the fifth, uh, which is when. We, we gather that plant in, in China when the yang qi is in the upper parts of the plant uh, before high noon. And yeah, so I had, I had put a lot of uh, effort into gathering and hanging and drying uh, the mugwort. And uh, there was a group of Westerners who were there learning at the time we had a program running and uh, Li Shifu went, uh, Li Shifu asked me to go and grab all of the mugwort that I had harvested and uh, we were gonna like have a spontaneous class. It was like the rest day <laughs> and we were gonna have a spontaneous class about how to roll moxa. And, uh, you know, I, I felt upset at the time because when I had harvested it, I, I hadn't harvested it with the intention of it being for the group. And, you know, that was his whole, lesson for me is is to kind of like forego the self um make oneself smaller he says to you know this the this, this circle that we draw around ourself can be smaller and smaller um then we can experience more compassion and um have more peace in our lives really and uh and so here's a great example of when thinking of the self it creates uh disharmony within and um agitated emotions and and so that's i i became agitated i felt like oh i really you know these were not my intentions for <laughs> these plants that i harvested and he was testing me to see can i let that go can i um can I be generous and give for others? And, uh, you know, that, that first time I, I think I failed basically, <laughs> um, I just kind of got upset and like left. Um, yeah. and then later, uh, later I calmed down and was like, actually nothing, none of this matters. Um, and he was like, I came back, I sat next to him and, and, and he was like, I, you know, so, you know, have you recollected yourself because I've written you a list of things that you learned from this? <laughs> and he gives me this list, uh, which I can't remember everything that I said off the top of my head now, but it was essentially just like, you know, that you've learned to like put yourself aside, consider the entire group, um, always give what's best to others. You know, th these are kind of the teachings that came along with that. Right. Yeah. I, I recall the, the list of the very last thing on the list. I think they were numbered one through five. And I think number five was, I'm very disappointed in you. And uh, yeah. that, that really hit me like a ton of bricks. And I think it probably did a lot of other people too, because we all have that story in our training. You know, we, we've all had that moment, right? Um, but I also think, you know, there's there's a moment too, where you 
for me, at least, I feel like a sense of relief that I'm part of something that's so much bigger than myself that I don't really matter that much anymore. And it's, it's kind of a relief. So. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, I think the book too, that was, I mean, that's the thing, because we all have our personal story, but in in a way, we're all going through the same thing. And so right. um, by telling the story truthfully, then others can be like, that's, that's exactly how I felt in this other scenario. And so it's been really nice to um, have that constant reminder that um, there are others like us going through the same thing. Absolutely. It's a wonderful book. I recommend it to everybody. Thank you. So did you did you get a lot of students as a result of the book? Did people come seek you out specifically because they'd read that book? Yes, uh, definitely. A lot of my students have read the book and that's how they found me. <clears throat> what is it? Do you think that there's anything that Dallas martial arts uh, offer specifically to women that other arts don't offer as much or don't emphasize as much? Well, I think that the fluidity and circularity of the physical movements, the the gracefulness, the um, the general methodology that the weak can overpower the strong through technique and through strategy is very conducive to women. <clears throat> I think that that spiritual component is also um, very suitable to women uh, as we are able to access stillness and the darkness and the unknown quite readily. And <clears throat> I think the Wudong swordsmanship is, uh, a I think weapons arts are great for women. Yeah. Personally, I find that uh, weapons arts are very empowering and it's that same principle of someone can be very small, but pick up a weapon and suddenly are much larger and yeah. is uh, an instant advantage uh, when you pick up the weapon. And so I think all of these uh, are, are reasons why Wudong martial arts uh, could be conducive to women. It's really, um, I think, just preference though. At what point did you decide that, that you were going to teach? When did you start teaching in the U.S.? Uh, so this was also by invite. Uh, I just had an opportunity to become an instructor at an acquaintance's uh, dojo. It was an Aikido dojo. Oh. And he wanted to have different traditional non-competitive arts uh, being represented at his dojo. And so that was that was what started that. Um, I, I came back from China to to do that teaching job. It took a long time to build up an audience and build up a name, teaching you know weekly drop in classes and trying to remodel everything that I had learned in a very traditional context into a modern. Um, mm -hmm business model, I guess. Uh, and that was that was really conflicting and frustrating and difficult at first, for sure. Uh, but as many years have gone by, I have found ways to go back towards that original way that I learned and uh, create a new model for learning in the West, uh, where it's immersive, a lifestyle, um, taking place in remote, natural wilderness locations, um, and essentially trying to recreate the context that that I learned in, because that was so much a part of it, uh, such an important component. And so when you take that experience, that full experience of self-cultivation through the Wudong arts, not only uh, martial, but including scripture, talisman, uh, calligraphy, uh, music, healing, meditation, everything. Uh, when you try to take that and put it into like a weekly drop in class, it 
it really uh, it doesn't translate well. And in in my feeling, it was dishonoring that path. Mm -hmm. And um, so it took me a long time to to figure that all out uh, and how to reconcile that. But it, because if if people think that they're going to enter into like a martial class um, in in the context that we're used to in the West, like you're just like once a week, you know, yeah. it's a side hobby, mm -hmm. it's for staying fit, um, versus the type of person who has already kind of been through all of that and decided that this is something that they want to focus more seriously on, something that they want to integrate into every aspect of their life. Um, that that really lines up a lot more with the traditional way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's I mean, it's it's really hard to recreate what what Shruva was able to do in the style in which he teaches. Uh, but but, you know, as the years go on, I I think I get closer to feeling in alignment with how I want to share the arts with the world. You mentioned in your book that when you first started coming, you were going back and forth between uh, China and the United States. You felt a, a, a disconnect, kind of a you know a cultural disconnect. And you know, um, your students when they're training in these immersive training, and then they go back to their everyday lives, do they tend to experience that same type of a uh, um, you know sort of like a I guess reality shift? It's, it's sometimes difficult to uh, go from an immersive training environment back to you know punching a clock or whatever it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and taking those teachings along with us. Have they ever expressed that to you? Yeah, they, they have. I, I think that it's on a smaller scale than when you, you know, say go to China and train in the temple yeah. and then go back to a different culture uh, and country. The shock there is much more strong, sure. but the, I think coming from one of my immersion <clears throat> programs back into one's personal life has you know a transition process for sure there's because of the intensive nature of my camps students are able to feel in their bodies and in their minds how those arts and skills transform the physiology and so once you've touched that and experienced that and then you go back into daily life and there's a feeling of that slipping away uh i think there's just as many teachings in that transition back into life mm. that there was on the kind of the upslope of of developing it and so i think that that transition is important and there's a lot of lessons there um comparisons that that one can make and and then trying to to change their daily lifestyle to better match what they experienced in the immersive setting. But I, I try to actually um, prepare people for that uh, in their intentions when they go home so that there isn't a strong break in the training for them. And with all of the online remote teachings, that I think really helps folks integrate training into their daily life inside of the context of their home. So there's a lot of ways to reintegrate now that that weren't available to me at that time because they had not yet have been forged. Those those pathways had not been forged yet when I was returning to the States. <clears throat> have you experienced a, a, a sort of an uptick in new students since uh, the pandemic? Did a lot of people find you through online classes during the pandemic? Yeah, definitely. Um, by uh, exposing oneself to a global audience where they don't have to travel to learn from you. <clears throat> Absolutely. There was a, a large number of people who uh, were able to to then have that opportunity to learn. I think that's been helpful to a lot of people, especially during that time. Yeah. You, you mentioned also in your book that prior to your first uh, trip to China to train that you had taken a, a course in a, a primitive living skills, like ancestral living skills. And that's something you now uh, incorporate into your uh, camps, right? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, kind of a, a long side at that time of my life, I 
was exposed to a wilderness survival school that largely shaped my worldview and the path that I'm on now, <clears throat> where uh, skills are taught that allow one to interact with the natural landscape in a direct way. And that was very special to me during my time at the temple because we think of Taoism as a nature-based philosophy and spiritual path, but when you look at living Taoism, you can't always see like exactly how how does that integrate? Um, how does one connect with the natural landscape on a deeper level? And what are some of the tools with which to do that? That wasn't necessarily readily available or being taught to me, but I had that influence uh, from from the school that I was attending in America, uh, ways to to communicate with the natural landscape and and draw those lessons from nature, and uh, it felt very in alignment with with the with the Taoist teachings. Uh, although I think that I, I wouldn't have known exactly how to implement those had I not also had some of that training from like indigenous uh, life ways. Uh, and so I, I integrate it into my camps because I think as, as humans, we have a natural desire to be one with the landscape. The body of the earth is, is our own body. And it's, it's just like in, in Taoism, we draw that relationship all the time of the internal landscape being a reflection of the, the external landscape. And we can describe it in all the same ways and we can tra traverse it in the same ways that we traverse a physical landscape in the external realm. And as far as the Taoist path, often it includes periods of time in retreat in remote locations uh, because this is part of the cultivation. You can't do certain things in an environment that have other humans around and, and noises and distractions like that. Uh, so in order to complete certain parts of the Taoist path, one would need to be comfortable and capable of providing for themselves in a remote wilderness location. and. So the path to get there involves some actual skills being learned, right? And so to me, the, those two skill sets really go hand in hand quite well. I agree. I think that you know, when you spend time, you know, the longer that you spend in nature, especially when you're far from civilization, your mind becomes so tuned into your own body. You know, we look at like a Taoist medicine and the insights that people are able to have, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago that are now being, you know, confirmed by modern science. And it was just because they had a lot of time on their hands. They had a lot of time to like observe their nature and their place in it. So that's probably pretty helpful to your students to be able to replicate that even for a shorter period of time. For sure. And, and, you know, even for my own cultivational path, I go, you know, so I have, I have this piece of land now um, that, that I'll go to and it's it's part of how I can also reconnect um, with myself, but also with uh, the even just the, the celestial bodies, even just having a place where you can observe the night sky or observe the sun rising and the sun setting, the moon rising, the moon setting, that observation, that daily connection to the celestial bodies is, is huge. Uh, there's so much contemplation that can occur is directly related to our meditative practices and philosophies and trying to understand the universe and our place within it. So that, that observation of nature is important on on my own cultivational path and uh, and for sure giving students the opportunity to touch that as well uh, influences their path. 
Can you uh, talk just a little bit about what a student could expect if they come to train with you? Like, what's the entryway to that? Like, if someone was wanted to train with you? Yeah. Uh, so, to train in person with me right now, I have two immersion camps that I run every year. I'd like to run more, um, but there's just there's a lot more um, logistical planning involved in hosting a large group of people in person. Sure. Uh, especially when the accommodations aren't, uh, the, it's camping. So right. the students uh, who come and train with me, they bring their own camping gear and we're camping out for two weeks. Uh, right now we have a really nice location, um, you know, that has um, really beautiful outdoor showers, bathrooms, a fully equipped kitchen. <clears throat> so we cook for each other. We have a, uh, like a food program where we have rotating uh, cooks and cook for each other. And this ends up being uh, an important part of the lifestyle. And uh, it's on the Illinois River, so there's, we can swim. Uh, so it's right now our location, it's not exactly roughing it. I used to make my students really rough it and that was a whole extra component to, to the process. Uh, but I've learned that it's it's much easier for the students to digest the material that I'm teaching them when when the the living situation isn't as rugged and bitter. Um, but again, in that you know we do what we know kind of a thing is <clears throat> the temple life was very rugged and bitter, and so that was always part of the process and uh, so I find my I found myself recreating that quite a bit in my programs, uh, and I've like backed off a little bit. Uh, but I do still I would like to uh, start teaching programs out on my land again, which is definitely a more rugged situation. Um, and I I did I did teach one immersion camp out there before the fire came, yeah. um, and that was a very special one where just naturally and effortlessly all of the nature-based teachings and ancestral skills and the martial skills, those two lifestyles really came together in this harmonious, effortless way uh, where I was able to really convey all of the different facets of, of, of those two pieces uh, because the landscape was teaching it in a way. Um, and so the the current formation of my camps is I've whittled it down to a two week program. So we don't do as much of the hands on learning of the ancestral skills like fire by friction or basketry or tracking and awareness. Um, we really focus a little bit more on the martial forms in that two week amount of time. But uh, eventually I will circle back to that that more of a scope of including both of them. That sounds amazing. Uh, the, the fire that you're referring to, that, that was the bootleg fire. The, the, mm -hmm. the, and so yeah. uh, could you talk briefly about that just for people who don't know about that? It was a very large forest fire, right? Yeah, so uh, the piece of land that I acquired is out in Klamath County on the um, native lands of the Klamath uh, people. Modoc and Yahuskin, the tribes. And uh, it's a very special piece of property that feels potent um, when you walk it. <clears throat> There's several locations that likely were uh, vision questing sites in the past. I've found arrowheads on the riverside. Uh, and um, this is a ponderosa pine forest. Uh, there was a lot of lodgepole there too prior to the fire. And it's a it's a ecosystem that is um, prone to fire and conditioned for fire. However, was one that was uh, of high intensity. And so the area uh, that I traversed, this kind of small area of the forest, um, was uh, completely burnt, uh, no survival of trees, uh, whereas other parts of the forest uh, did better. Right. And um, like the larger trees survived and it cleared out the understory and it did uh, it did its thing well. But uh, 
yeah, so the, the landscape was entirely changed, um, but that really taught me so much that I could have never expected. And uh, so it's still a very beautiful and alive and thriving ecosystem, but it's just completely changed now into a snag forest. Um, and all of the, you know, it's all dead standing trees. Uh, sometimes I call it the ghost forest because it's it's a forest that's very much alive, but in this um, kind of ghostly remembrance way. Um, and then new life is forming. And I think, so I think that in, especially, you know, these times where we're discovering a lot about fire ecology, and it's on a lot of people's minds because many have also experienced uh, fire touching their lives in one way or another. So part of uh, what I want to integrate into my future programs out on the land would be observation of that progression and succession of a post-fire landscape and how fire plays a very special role. Uh, it helps undo paradigms that we're not even aware that we have uh, views of of how nature functions and its cycles and uh yeah so so that's that's the story of what what happened out on the land and then it <clears throat> led me to uh start this process of reforestation and learning how to plant wild seeds. Um, that area of uh, the Kalamath lands is a place where many of the first foods or the, the foods that the first peoples subsisted off of and tended to are still thriving out there, like the biscuit root. Um, and so a lot of that seed propagation is often focused on those um, subsistence foods mm -hmm. and and making sure that those are thriving and being tended to. Uh, for me, it's been one of my focuses has been for replanting trees uh, because that it really gave me this perspective. Losing all of the trees gave me this perspective on time. And so in my mind, the trees are what's going to take the longest uh, to one day see again uh you know 30 40 years and so my my scope of time has changed quite a bit and and my intentions of you know what what do i leave behind has really shifted into intentions of the next generation and the generation after that is is where i'm you know, planting the seeds of what I leave behind um, is not for my lifetime, but uh, the following generation. And so uh, learning how to replant what would hopefully be able to one day turn into an old growth forest. Yeah. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so I've been focusing on planting sugar pine because this is a native tree to that area that also provides food for people. Um, and for um, for any living entities on the landscape, uh, the pine nut and uh, and those seeds that I harvested in the wild are um, sprouting and doing pretty well, and that's exciting to watch. And so it's yeah, it's, I think all of that again is very much in alignment with the Taoist path. Even the fire itself was very reminiscent of legends, you know, that I've read about of the ancestors and their path and um, building something up and then losing it, you know, yeah. and then um, learning that temporal nature of all things, uh, seeing. Um, that type of purification or cleansing or starting a new happen before your eyes um, is is a very unique experience. Walking the landscape after the fire was very much like walking um, 
like a like almost like an ice age event it was just there was nothing alive um and that was a very interesting feeling uh <clears throat> and there's something very clean about the landscape there now very uh open and and pure it's just there's the forest was so complex before, you know, and you couldn't really see through all of the brush. And now everything has um, become exposed. Uh, actually, interestingly, like there's a lot of cliffside caves out in that area that were all hidden previously by um, the thick brush. And so those have become exposed and I found a lot more of those. Uh, it's just a beautiful phenomenon to witness and it reminds me of the importance of witnessing that beauty of the earth and not missing it you know it's a reminder that we could miss so much by living our modern life and civilization is conditioning us to look away from that grand magnificence that exists in our life um, on the earth and and we forget we forget about it and we look you know this way towards society and towards the things that um we have to maintain our work our success uh, you know and and meanwhile the the magnificence and beauty of of the natural landscape is is there um and slowly um uh, sl slowly going away um yeah and yeah i mean even just like recently i had a conversation with a um astronomer you know and just talking about the stars and just the sheer magnificence of if you can just look up at the night sky and contemplate that for just one moment and and the fact that we don't take the time to do that uh more frequently is 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 quite bizarre yeah it's almost like we're sleepwalking through our own lives sometimes the things that we miss but it's amazing that you had that opportunity of the i say opportunity of the fire the crisis the opportunity of the fire and, and, the, and the foundation to recognize it you know for what it was um it's something pretty amazing um so going forward into the future what do you see for the future of Taoism and Taoist arts uh particularly in the west do you think that's going to be something that's going to like help people see things the way that you're seeing them now? Do you think it's uh do you think it's on the rise? I do. I think that Taoism in the West is on the rise for sure. And it's um it's gonna go through a process similar to if we were to look at how you know Hinduism and yoga came to the West, and then if we look at how Buddhism has evolved in the West, Taoism is just like a little bit behind on that um <clears throat> Taoism has a lot of fertile ground for the western mind to relate to i think um i think that the western mind and western culture there's the aspect of Taoism that is uh non-dogmatic uh and a philosophy life way that is appealing to many um Westerners, and however, that's not the, that's not the entire picture of what Taoism is uh, right. and the tradition as a whole. So Taoism also includes um, organized religious practices, uh, temple practices. It it does it has its own share of religious dogma. Um, and so I, I think it's interesting to think about how that piece of Taoism is going to move into the West and be received and how to do that in uh, an authentic way where we're not um, just choosing that one philosophical aspect of it without understanding its entirety. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting topic that I've been thinking a lot about uh, is is how how to in our modern culture and in our society in the West uh, reconnect to 
faith and spirituality in a way that is how do I put this? Uh, I find that uh, people often they don't like the religious side of things, right? Because we have many of us experienced um, trauma or abuse that we associate with religion. Mm -hmm. um, we have the aspects of religion that can suppress our human nature and create ideas of <clears throat> um, like, you know, inherent sin or that we should feel guilty or punished for our nature. Um, there's a lot of these sticky parts to religion. And even when you try to speak about it, there's so many assumptions being made in the languaging of how we how we discuss it. Um, so so when a spiritual practice like let's say Taoism, um, when when folks discover that that has a pantheon of deities and um, religious practices and precepts and rules and regulations, um, that can be a trigger or a turn off for many uh, for many people in the West, um, at least maybe maybe across the world. I don't know, but in the West for sure. Um, and so I'm really curious to have conversations about that and and how we can uh, learn how to encounter with discernment but also reconnect with faith and reimagine what faith is and feels like in a way that can resonate with many, that doesn't feel like, like a, um, I think that people, struggle with faith and believing in something one because we have a logical mind where if we like we need to see it to believe it kind of a thing um but then two because there is this uh sort of christian paradigm i think where if we believe in something then we become subordinate to it and it's this kind of like overwatching thing that is going to either uh, reward or punish us. And, and so all of that is just, we don't have to think of it that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And so through conversation and dissecting languaging um, and cultural assumptions, I think that we could, through Taoism, find a way to reconnect to faith and um, communication with the formless realms and the mystery in a way that that feels um, fresh and authentic. What do you think? <laughs> I agree with you 100%. I, I think it's a very important and also precarious time for, for Taoism, especially, you know, in the West. I think that it's good that there are conscientious people like yourself out there that are trying to point people in the right direction. Because I think what's happening right now is very important for what the future of Taoism is going to look like. Uh, so, yeah, for so for me, um, uh, uh, something that I feel really inspired about contributing is to create place-based context for Taoism. And so, for me, those the components that that would include would be a temple, hmm. um, a place where people could feel what that looks like and feels like to engage with an altar, for example, in that way of ritual worship. And um, seeing how, so I feel really inspired to research and create, you know, a team of architects, geomancers, astronomers, builders, um, to um, erect a temple that is in alignment with the celestial bodies, how a traditional temple would be, to create context and culture for this uh, practice to come out in a place where it currently does not have that same place-based context that it does have 
such a rich and long history of in China that yeah. immediately is palpable and vivid when you go there. But then when you are in the West, there's nothing, there's no context for that to come forth. And so part of my vision is to create that context um, so that that entirety of what Taoism is can be felt. <clears throat> So is that something that you're planning to do on your land possibly? It's yeah, it's in the works. It's it's kind of in that seed process of just envisioning it. Um, and you know, there there's probably many steps in between now and then. But but yeah, that's that's something that's on my mind. That will be interesting to see how that develops. So what other projects do you have coming up in the future? Anything that you wanted to promote? Uh, well, the camps are coming up and open for application and registration. Uh, they'll be this summer in July and August, and they happen every summer. So depending on the timing of when uh, someone is listening to this, they, they, you know, each year there's a different new ones. And uh, right now I'm offering a meditation course that is ongoing, and that has been uh really fruitful for my own practice and um, refining how I share that piece of Taoist practice, um, seated meditation. And so that's, you know, that's every Wednesday and um, that's kind of the main thing that I'm doing right now. Uh, that has been an interesting um, focus, like I said, for, for my own development as well. And uh, yeah, aside from that, just the ongoing um, online classes. Right now I'm running one uh, for Seven Star Sword. And uh, those, I typically do more of those in the winter time. Any plans for another book? Uh, you know, definitely there is, uh, I'm not eager, to write it though it's not somehow it's you know how books really come out on their own timing they they're almost like um kind of they kind of possess you and take over yeah. and then the, then then you're just kind of on that timeline and that hasn't really happened yet although there is a sense that one day there, there probably will be another book um might not be like the first necessarily uh but yeah, no, cur currently I'm not writing a book, uh, but I do I do want to get back into writing maybe smaller articles, uh, and I am excited to, I have a couple topics in mind that have, that I've wanted to express um, for a while. Um, yeah, one of them is really just like outlining martial etiquette. <clears throat> Another one is uh, about you know, just kind of discussing how martial arts plays into the more quietistic practices of inner cultivation. Because I think that that's like a something that people are confused about a lot of the time at first. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> something to look forward to. So people can find you at what? what is your website? My website is wudongwhitehorse.com. Uh, so that's W-U-D-A-N-G whitehorse.com and you can pretty much find everything there and follow me on social media under my name, Lindsay Way, Instagram and Facebook. Awesome. It's a pretty good way to, yeah, keep up to date on what I'm doing. Well, Lindsay, thank you very much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Can you stick around for just a sec? Yep. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much for having me. Thanks a lot.